On my elementary school bus route, there was an unspoken hierarchy regarding the seats. The sixth graders and cool kids got to sit in the last four rows of the bus, and everyone else sat where they wanted to. My neighbor was considered one of those cool kids, and in fourth grade, on an afternoon, she invited me to join her to sit in the back. Giddy at the opportunity to sit there before I hit sixth grade, I hopped on and made my way to the back. You see, I've always been a social individual. An extroverted introvert is what I like to call myself. As a child, I loved to tell stories. There was no hesitation for me to join in with my brothers or my friends from school. I had a slight delay in the development of my speech, but testing showed nothing abnormal. I was just a late bloomer. When my mom told a four-year-old me to get the mail from the mail slot on our porch, I stood there not doing anything. Surprised, she repeated herself, and I said, oh, sorry, I thought you said broken nail. A hearing test later, and it was confirmed that I had a bilateral sensory neural hearing loss that was mild to moderate. In layman's terms, that means that I have a hearing loss in both ears that has to do with how my inner ear is structured and that it means I struggle with speech sounds. It's believed that my left ear made up, with, uh, made up for what my right ear missed, and that's why I was able to fool people for so long. Due to an old interest in becoming a teacher of the deaf, my mother had some base knowledge about deaf culture and hearing loss. Beyond that, my parents only knew how to live and function as hearing people in a hearing world. No one else in my life had a hearing loss. With my hearing aids in, I could hear just about as well as my brother's. At school, I used a device that transmitted the teacher's voice directly into my hearing aids. Beyond that technical difference, I saw no difference between myself and my hearing peers. At least, I didn't until that fourth grade afternoon on the bus. I made my way to sit in the back with my neighbor, and I encountered a sixth grader who stepped into the aisle. I pointed to my neighbor, and before, she, uh, before I could say anything, she put up her hand and stopped me. We don't want you back here. Only people who can hear are allowed to sit with us. My world moved into slow motion. I floundered to respond and turned to the nearest open seat. I remember holding back tears until I got off the bus and ran home crying. This is the first moment in my memory that I was introduced to the idea that my hearing loss could be considered a reason to exclude me that people could see my hearing loss as a negative and see me as not worthy. That experience didn't stop me from engaging with the world, but it did set a subconscious precedence in my mind that my disability was something to be ashamed of and to hide unless I had no other choice. From then on, I began masking my hearing loss. I adopted the smile and nod mentality when I didn't hear or understand someone. Better to fake it until I make it than have someone have to repeat themselves multiple times and make my difference known. I had the added benefit of not sounding deaf, that my speech is not impacted by my hearing loss. This assisted with being able to remain hearing passing. When I was nine, my father was diagnosed with leukemia. Two years later, he was in remission after a successful bone marrow transplant that reset his immune system. We were excited to return to previous Christmas traditions, like hitting the after Christmas sales. He picked up the common cold on that trip, and his immune system was not able to fight back. 
the last time I saw my father, he was weak, and so he spoke softly. Terrified seeing my father in that hospital bed, the smile and nod strategy reared its head. So I nodded at him when he spoke to me, even though I hadn't heard his words. My mom asked me if I heard him, and I shook my head sheepishly. My father repeated himself, saying, I love you, and I said it back. My father died the following morning. If my mother hadn't asked me, I would not have heard my father's last words to me. For the next five years, my residual hearing and my hearing aids allowed me to continue masking my hearing loss. So it was a shock one morning when I woke up not being able to hear anything. I popped my ears, no change. I put my hearing aids in and could barely hear with their assistance. We made an appointment to see my audiologist who tested my hearing and my hearing aids. I was suddenly no longer in the mild to moderate range. I was in the moderate to profound range. My audiologist could give us no explanation as to why I had this sudden drop in my hearing and referred me to an ears, nose, and throat doctor. When we would see that doctor two days later, my hearing had returned to my normal. The doctor had no explanation either. For the next year, I would experience this yo-yoing of my hearing loss with various lengths of time between each instance. Genetic testing identified no genetic cause for my hearing loss, and a CT scan confirmed that my hearing loss was due to the way my cochleas are formed, but it provided no insight into why I was experiencing these fluctuations. It was a terrifying next few years. I didn't know if eventually my hearing would level out, and if it did, where on my spectrum of hearing it would be. I didn't know what a further diminished hearing loss would mean for me. Would I still be able to be independent? Would I still be able to be the teacher that I had imagined myself to be? Would the world view me, or how would the world view me, if I was no longer hearing passing, but someone who was deaf? I avoided really digging into these questions for a long time. I went to college for elementary special education with the plans to be a special education teacher. That would be the kind of teaching environment I would thrive in, both in passion and in a subtle way of managing my accessibility needs. In order to be successful as a perceived hearing individual in this new world of independence at school and student teaching, I had learned how to manipulate my situations to best serve me and my hearing person persona. I found student teaching placements that were small class sizes and allowed me to work with disabled students. I became a resident assistant so that I could be social in smaller group contexts and not bother roommates with my very loud devices. In my junior year, the student teaching placement was not something I could manipulate. All of us were going to the same school and working with students kindergarten through third grade. I was placed in a full-size regular education kindergarten classroom, but I was excited. This would be a classroom type I had not worked with before. So I walked into that classroom and immediately felt like I had walked in on an auditory hurricane. I was introduced to the class and the teacher pointed me to a small group activity to lead. I struggled to hear the students at my table. There were other students calling my name across the classroom as they vied for my attention. The clatter of counting manipulatives and building blocks was the percussion that overtook everything else. I'm ashamed to admit, I only tried to be in that classroom one more time. 
It wasn't until mid-November when the semester was going to end in a few weeks that I finally got over my shame and spoke to my professor about how I had avoided my hours and struggled in that classroom. The next day, she and my academic advisor, a pro another professor in my program, sat down with me to discuss my options. Student teaching in strictly special education class, cla bleh, bleh. teaching, student teaching in strictly special education placements was not an option due to how state certification worked. We don't know how to support you through student teaching. We recommend that you take a non-certification path so you can still graduate with a degree on time. Looking back now, the irony is not lost on me that professors teaching how to support disabled students told me, a disabled student, that they didn't know how to support me or that there was a historic school for the deaf just down the road from campus that could have been a great resource. I left that meeting with that slow motion feeling again. It moved me into a cycle of grief that was all too familiar and yet so uniquely its own. I was forced to face those questions that had originally haunted me when my hearing first started fluctuating. I denied to myself that my diminished hearing was no longer fluctuating, but becoming stagnant at that lower level. I was angry at my body for failing me. I bargained with the universe, saying that I already had enough challenges and it wouldn't be fair to give me another one. And then I fell into depression where it was hard to get out of bed and to class. I wouldn't be hearing passing anymore and therefore people would treat me differently. I was already seen as incapable of student teaching, so how was I going to be able to engage with the world successfully? At some point, through the aid of my friends and family, I was able to begin accepting that this diminished hearing loss was my new reality. I needed to find ways to cope and move forward. I researched ways to support myself and remain independent. This led to pursue uh, my first hearing service dog and got partnered in February 2014 with my first dog, Shanty. This acceptance meant that I searched for a career path that was still fulfilling and supported my needs. I found student affairs in higher education. I thrived as a resident assistant, and the student affairs would be the professional next step. I could still be an educator, but instead of teaching the ABCs, I was teaching how to adult and be successful college students. I found institutions that saw my disability and service dog and chose not to let that factor into their hiring of me. This grieving process and the path to acceptance was vital in allowing me to embrace my disability. I didn't know it at the time, but I was shifting my mindset away from the medical model of disability and into the social model of disability. The medical model of disability is what people think of most often when they think of disability, that there is a problem with the person that needs to be fixed. But the social model of disability says there's nothing wrong with the person. It's that they live and function in a world, in a society that was not built for them. It's changing the mindset from Jackie's hearing loss prevented her from watching the movie in theaters and into the lack of captioning at the theater prevented her from seeing it in the theaters. Or another example, Luke can't use stairs so he was unable to go to that restaurant and instead shifting it to the restaurant lacked a ramp so Luke was unable to eat there. 
embracing the social model and my disability led me to see the skills and coping mechanisms I had gained through my disability in a new and positive light. From a previous supervisor, I learned that my skill for reading body language and facial expressions was not universal. I was able to teach her how I catch those nonverbal signals and apply them to my engagement with the world. I embraced my advocating skills for the positive it provides me rather than the chore and frustration I used to view it as. I was able to advocate for my accessibility needs in my workplace and created allies who now consider those accommodations standard practice. I have gained confidence and am competent when engaging with others. While I still on occasion get caught smile and nodding to things I don't hear, it happens far less. I'm not ashamed to ask someone to repeat themselves multiple times and to let them know it's because I have a hearing loss. I understand that my educating and advocacy means that people will be able to see situations in a new context, and if disability-related, hopefully make access easier for those who come after me. According to the United States Center for Disease Control, 27% of the population is disabled. That is one in four individuals that you know have a disability, be that cognitive or physical. That is the second largest minority in the country, surpassing race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and religion. You may not know that your coworker, neighbor, or even family member is disabled because they can pass as able-bodied. They may be doing what I did as a child and present themselves as able-bodied. Maybe it's purposeful masking or simply trying not to complicate daily encounters. Anyone can become a part of the disability community at any time. Maybe they, like me, lost hearing over time. Perhaps someone gets in a car accident and becomes paralyzed. Or maybe someone who has an experience that causes a mental health challenge to no longer be something in the background of their daily life, but instead begins impeding it. It always brings me immense relief and joy when disability has been considered and access is a given, not a request. When I ask about captioning and get the immediate, yes, here's how to access it. Or when I travel or go somewhere new and I only get the legally allowed two questions, is that a service dog and what tasks is it trained to perform before being able to enter without further access issues? It's these little moments that save me so much time and energy. It lets me know that I matter and have been considered and it gives me hope for the future that disability will not be something that people will feel the need to hide or be ashamed of. The shift to the social model of disability and consideration for disabled people means that a new community member will not have to measure their value against a world that is no longer built for them. I think back to that day on the bus and I wonder how that encounter would have changed if I had the understanding and acceptance of disability I do now instead of the one instilled in me as that fourth grader. The bully would likely still have bullied and tried to use my disability against me, but maybe I would have been able to push back. I would have known that disability wasn't something wrong or to be ashamed of. And I could have moved on from that experience feeling the need to not pretend to be something and someone I'm not. Thank you.